All right, y'all can have your seats. We praise God for you. And we're going to continue. This is actually the last installment of our Give Us This Day series. And I, I want to, I just want to, there's just a few thoughts that I need to give you just kind of to round out um, this conversation. This is actually one sermon that I realized I couldn't preach in one week because it's so many elements to it. And, and so this is the third of, of the three installments of this conversation. And, and my hope has been from the very beginning that you would not just say amen to what is being said. It is so easy, and I'm about to be real frank right here. It's so easy in black churches for us to get whipped up. I'm, I'm telling the truth because y'all know I'm right. And, and get real excited and, you know, you know, go head on and we, we appreciate the word. And you know how we do it. Boy, that boy sure did preach. Well, what did he say? Well, I don't really know what all he said. I'm just telling you the truth. Y'all say it at Thanksgiving dinner, you, you know. The fact is that sometimes we can get so enamored with the preaching moment and all of the stylistic elements and the personality traits that go along with the rhetorical element and communicating and all that kind of stuff that we could at the same time miss the point, right? And we, and we, and we leave excited but not different. We leave enthusiastic but not transformed. Preach, Pastor Jeremy. And, and what I'm hoping in these three weeks that we've taught on, at least on this part, is that you have actually taken to heart the things that we've tried to express so that your life can actually be different. Does anybody want something different? Does anybody want to walk in a newfound confidence with a newfound security? My God. And so we're going right back to Matthew 6, 11. I'm going to read that just that single verse one more time. Then I'm going to give you three elements or three ideas that you ought to be thinking about when you pray this prayer each morning. It simply says, give us, somebody shout today. today. Come on, shout today. today. Now here it is. Why don't you listen to this part? Our daily bread. Listen very carefully. Our daily bread. I want to focus on our daily bread. Here's the first point. Let me cut to the chase. The first point is this. When you pray this prayer in the morning, what you're saying is, Lord, when I pray, give me today my daily bread, I only want what's for me. Point number one. Come on. I only want what's for me. When I pray this prayer... Give us our, this day our daily bread. I only want you to give me the things you have intentioned to be a part of my life. I don't want this day somebody else's daily bread. I'm not looking for a blessing that you have assigned to someone else's life. Every promise ever made is not a promise made to me. There are promises that have been made to people in Scripture in totality that don't apply to my life. But there are things that God has specifically engineered and developed for my purpose. Watch this. When I pray, give us this day our daily bread, I only want what's for me because I realize that God knows who I am and knows what I need. So if I wanted to take what somebody else got, or take what he promises someone else and apply it to my life, the fact is what they are receiving was never intention or fashion to meet the needs that I face. But I need you, God, to give me exactly what it is you have for me. I believe that many of us will be less disappointed in life if we realize that everything that's being given out ain't for you. Jesus we fall into the comparison trap because we look at other people being blessed in unique ways. We look at how God is releasing things to other people, the timing of God in their lives. We see how God is pouring out in other ways. We see what's happened over there. And because we don't have a good perspective on getting from God what is for us, we start to become envious and jealous. We start to backbite and slander and hate on what God is doing on somebody else's life because we have not realized that God has fashioned some things for them that he never fashioned for me. But if I can stop being preoccupied with your stuff and start saying, Lord, I don't care how you're blessing Cindy, Sue, Billy, and James. I only want
want what you have for me because a blessing to them that came to me would be a curse in my life. But you know my frame. You know my constitution. So God, I need you to give me the things that you are, have made for me. Is there anybody in the house that ever sat back and realized that though I didn't get all the things I thought I wanted, as I look at myself now, I realize that if God would have given me the stuff that I thought I wanted, it would have wrecked and ruined my life. But thank God you only gave me the stuff that's for me. I'm going to go a little bit deeper because y'all not coming with me. The fact, there's some men right now, you couldn't sleep without that woman. You thought she was the best thing that could ever happen to you. You prayed and fasted that God would release that woman into your life. But God said no. And right now, as you look back, you say, Lord, thank you for not answering some prayers in my life because some of your nose, God, actually kept me from being in a worse place. Is there anybody here that's grateful that sometimes God said no, that sometimes God shut the door, that sometimes God held you back? We got to learn that every single thing that you and I think that we want are not the things that God has designed and assigned to our lives, but I'm learning the discipline of saying, Lord, I don't know all the details of everything, but here's what I'll say, God. You know me, my uprising and my downsetting. You know where I've been and you know where I'm going. So God, when I pray this prayer, I'm not asking for you to give me what you gave to somebody else. I'm asking you to give me what I think I ought to deserve. I'm saying, Lord, give me exactly what you know I need. Some of your lives would change if you said, Lord, I'm going to stop writing the agenda. Jesus, help me, Holy Spirit. I'm going to stop dictating to you what I think you ought to do. I'm going to stop telling you and ordering you around like you're some genie in a bottle. And I'm going to say, Lord, whatever it is that you have assigned to my life, God, that's what I'll take. Is there anybody in the house this morning that can testify that God knows better than you? We think we know. We're looking around. Isn't it amazing? You ever watch television? Of course you do. Watch television. And it's amazing how, all, uh, how, how consumer-driven our society is and, and, and how the ads work. The ads work by trying to convince you that you are lacking something that you need. Right? So I was telling you, you know, all kind of stuff. When, you know, even when it comes, can, can I just go a little deeper? When it comes to drugs. Not, not the ones that you smoke, heathens. I'm talking about the, the pharmaceutical drugs. It starts asking you questions. Do you get sleepy at night? <laughs> Does your back hurt when you run? Right? So I ask you all these questions. What's it trying to do? It's trying to create a, a, a plot, a, a, a thick and a plot. It's trying to create a platform, right, to sell you something. Jesus, my God. And so what happens is, in the, I'm, I'm showing you a minute, in the consumer industry, it starts to tell you and get you to believe all the stuff that's wrong with you or that you are lacking or that you are missing. Jesus, are you hearing what I'm saying? See, you? So you don't have enough of this. You only got a TV in one room in your house. Oh, oh see? You only have a one-car garage, you right, 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 right. I mean, it tries to tell you all the stuff that you don't have, that you don't, that you're not walking in, and you just you don't have. You can't go to Bora Bora and have a vacation on top of the water, which you know all the stuff that you want, and then watch this, and then it, it jumps from what you don't have then to what you deserve. Oh, I'm, I'm teaching good. You just ain't getting it yet. It starts with what you don't have. You don't have this. You don't have that new vacuum cleaner that cleans on the carpet and on the hardwood and can cut your grass. You don't, you don't have that vacuum. You don't have that, right? And then, 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 it, then it shifts from what you don't have to what you deserve. Don't you deserve to be able to, you know, vacuum your carpet and cut your grass? Don't you, right? don't, don't you deserve? Aren't you good enough? Well, who, who, is, someone, is that person better than you? Starts to, starts to peel, starts to push at what you ought to have, and starts to push, and then it starts to show you these grand pictures of other people that have the things that you don't have. <laughs> Jesus. And then you look at the person that, that's, that's mowing their lawn, and then that's vacuuming their, their carpet, and that person is all cut up, and they're beautiful, and got makeup on, and they're strapping, they got the finest clothes, and you're saying, I'm, I'm, I can 
look like that. All I gotta do is get a vacuum cleaner. I'm gonna get a six pack. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the fact is, you start. It, start, it goes from what you don't have to what you deserve, watch this, then it moves into what other people have that you don't have, right? It's a very specific plot to get you to buy into something that was never intended for you. Now watch this, Satan is the exact same way. Satan starts by telling you, watch this, by telling you what you don't have. He begins to pour into your insecurities. He begins to point out your defects. He begins to highlight the things that, that ought to be this way or ought to be that way. or ought to be. And then he starts to say this, well, don't you deserve? Jesus, let's go. In the garden with Adam and Eve, right? Did God really say? See, he knows that there is something you could have that you don't have. And you ought to have what he has. Look what God has. Why don't you have what God has? See, you won't say amen because you're caught in the trap already. Oh, yeah, we all are. We all caught in the trap. We caught in the trap. I'm, I'm, we, we're coming out. We, this is Liberty Day. We've been emancipated today from the trap. Now, watch what he does. And then once he gets us in the web of, of, of insecurity, in the web of, of the comparison trap, in the web of, of, of jealousy and, and animosity and, and hating, then he springs the trap and we start to go and get things and try to fill the void that Satan has created inside of us. Jesus, I'm preaching so good, I almost can't stand myself. The fact is, there are things that you own right now, friends that you have right now, people in your relationship right now that were never for you, but because Satan exposed an insecurity in you, you start to try to fill the void and the gap of your insecurity with people and things and stuff and vacations, and now your credit is through the roof because you spent what you didn't have to get what you didn't need. Preach, Pastor Jeremy. You got hookups and friends right now that mean you no good, but you are trying to fill a void that Satan created in you. This prayer undoes that. I'm going to stop living at the whims and the impulses of negativity created by Satan and say, Lord, I don't want nothing that you don't want for me. Not another person, not another thing, not another job, not another place. I don't want a single thing, God, that you don't want for me. Give me today my daily bread. I don't want your bread. I don't like your bread. I don't eat that type of bread. I want my bread. You hear what I'm saying to you? That's number one. Here's number two. This is going to get ugly, so just brace yourself. Number two is this. This prayer causes you to consider the notion that you worked up an appetite. Now, here, listen. Because you can't feed full people. Take a minute. You can't feed, watch this. When I say, Lord, feed me, I'm saying, I'm hungry. If you're not praying this prayer, forget the actual words. There's not a hunger inside of you. The question is this. this. This prayer caused me to question my hunger. If I'm not hungry, maybe I need to do more stuff that makes me hungry. Jesus. All right. Pastor, what are you talking about? Here's the deal. What tends to happen is this. We get full maybe from all of what God gives us. There's some people that come into churches all across this world. They sit under teaching where someone is pouring out the word of God, giving jot and tittle, giving step by step, giving all sorts of sustenance and food to feed the soul that it might be utilized to do the work of the kingdom. But what happens is this. If you continue to eat, but you never get up and work off what you ate. Two things will happen. Y'all just had Thanksgiving dinner. You know what happens at about eight, nine o'clock. You sitting in an easy boy with your pants unbuckled because you ate so much, you're full. And even, well, some of y'all maybe can still eat a little bit, but, but when food passes by, 
You don't even want the food because you're full from what you just ate. Jesus. The second thing that happens is this. Food has always been intended in the body to create energy for us to work. Bread breaks down in consumption, is turned into glucose, fills your bloodstream that it might energize and animate your life. But if you continue to eat it and you never get up and expend the energy, what happens is it begins to stay in the same place. Jesus. The tire around my waist is proof that there is a differential between the consumption and the exertion. The fact is this. Some of us in the household of faith are praying for God to fill us up. And God is saying, what did you do with what I already gave you? Some of us don't even pray the prayer for God to feed us because we're not hungry, Jesus. And we're just content with sitting in the same place, doing the same stuff, never exercising a gift, never walking in our anointing, never moving an evangelistic thrust, never taking on initiatives. You ain't witness to nobody. You ain't blessed nobody. You ain't poured out into nobody. You ain't shared the faith with nobody. You ain't lifted nobody. You haven't been a, 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 a refuge or anything. You've just been kind of consuming all the stuff that God has available and never giving it out to anyone else. Can I testify just for a moment, family? I, I hope that we can raise up a church, not just here, but clear across this country of people that come into buildings like this, receive the good word and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then go out into the world and utilize the things that God has placed in them. The fact is the reason that there's so much infighting, there's so much division, there's so much drama, there's so much criticism that's happening in places like this. It's because you got full people trying to be fed. But when people in the household of faith will stop sitting around just consuming everything that's available, but will get up and begin to use what God has blessed them with. Child of God, you pray a prayer differently. See, people who pray for a thing pray differently when they really need it. This is why when we try to talk about people getting excited or people getting hungry, some folk just kind of laying back. I don't, I don't think it takes all of that. I don't think it's ain't that deep. I don't know why you got to do all that, all this, whatever. But people who have expended everything they have, people who have blown through all the energy that you have when you pray this prayer you pray in desperation God the reason I need more bread because I used all the bread you gave me yesterday when you fed me yesterday I worked myself to the bone so this morning I know I can't move into a new dimension trying to live off of what sustained me yesterday but I've got a hunger I've got a thirst that's brand new is there anybody in the house that when you wake up you wake up hungry you wake up ready you wake up going to do something because you use what God gave you yesterday. You hear what I'm saying to you? Part of the challenge is that you can't feed hungry people. I mean, you can't feed full people. I was talking to a friend about a year, year or so ago. He was talking about conversation having with people and you know, people being challenged, you know, in the whole comparison thing. He said, I just, he said, I just said this. He said, it's not that I'm better than you. I'm just hungrier than you. And sometimes, let me come here. Listen, sometimes there are people in your life that offend you because they're hungry. Well, he just thinks he's all that. No, 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 no. He's hungry. Well, he's always doing it. She's always, no, 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 no. She's hungry. She just want to be on display. Nope. She's hungry. Every time something come up, she the first one to raise her hand and get involved. It's because she's hungry. And the one thing about, that bothers people about hungry people is that it exposes that you're full. Can I just get real? There's some people that ain't never going nowhere because they ain't hungry. 
and, and you check in with them about 15 years from now. They were doing the exact same thing they've always been doing because they're not hungry. It's not that they don't have capacity, not that they're not smart or talented or have the full measure of God's grace on their life. They're just not hungry. And let me challenge you. I told you two weeks ago, avoid broke people and stingy people, but also avoid hung, uh, full people. I, I don't want no full people around my life. People who are satisfied with where they are, people who are just like, you know what? I done did what I'm going to do. I ain't doing nothing. I'm just going to work this little job. I'm just, those people can't roll with a dude like me. But if there's somebody in my midst that's hungry for something else, that you've seen God do great stuff, but you want God to do more stuff, you want to see the hand of God exposed in the earth, you're not satisfied with where you are, but you want to see a manifestation of the power of God. Those are the type of folks you have to find those people because full people don't go nowhere. Woo! I hope I'm not preaching to full people this morning. Full people lay back in lazy boys because they're lazy boys. This is good. I, I'm hoping that this is hurting someone. <laughs> I really did. I really am. I'm hoping that, it, I'm hoping, hoping that it's exposing something in, in us. I had a conversation this past weekend. A friend of mine was talking about a lot of stuff going on and all the things that we have, and whatever, and it just exposed. Being around someone that's hungry will expose sometimes the lethargy in your own life. And I feel like I'm, I'm a relatively hungry dude in, in the metaphoric sense and in the regular sense, right? <laughs> I'm a hungry guy. But when I hang around really hungry people, it just changes. It just, I start checking myself, taking a self-inventory. What have I done? Where am I at? Where, where are the irons in the fire? Where, how am I applying myself? How am I getting the highest and best use out of what God's deposited in me? Find you some hungry people. It will challenge you, it will irritate you, but it will make you better. Get some hungry. If Jesus, I got another point, but I just if 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 you are the most of whatever in the circle of friends you got, you got to add some friends to that equation. Preach, Pastor Jeremy. I'm, I'm going to use, you know, my generation's language. If you're the top dude in your crew, get a new crew. You hear what I'm saying? Iron can't sharpen iron if one of the irons is dull and broken and apathetic. But do you have people in your life that are hungry? Every time you see them come, you're like, oh, God, here we go. Because you know they got a new idea. Wake up in the morning. Hey, I was thinking about a new app. <laughs> Hungry. Care how old you are, you can still be hungry. You hear what I'm saying? And I, and, and I, I, I visited churches. And I walk in. And I look. And I, I look not just at the empty seats, but I look at the emptiness behind their eyes. Going through the motions. Just because this is what we've always done. Don't see an ounce of hunger in the building. No drive, no passion. Not willing to make mistakes to get where you're trying to go. Playing it safe, playing it close. Scared. Ain't hungry. You hear what I'm saying to you? And my hope is this, that we are raising up a generation of people that are hungry. Because you can't feed full people. You got pastors and leaders and apostles who are sweating and crying and preaching some of their best stuff. And nobody's doing anything because the people are full. Preach, Pastor Jerry. 
And I'm praying that this house, the reason why I'm asking you to pray this prayer, because I'm saying, Lord, maybe this prayer will start to just create a flame of hunger in people. You hear what I'm saying? Let me get this last one. Get out your way. Not only, this is what's for me. Not only is it the, the notion that I worked up an appetite. But lastly, what I receive is commensurate with what I expect to expend. Bread turns into energy, so I hunger for enough to sustain me at the level of my, expect, at my expected output. Let me read it again. Bread turns into energy, so I hunger for enough to sustain me at the level of my expected output. Listen. When you pray for bread, this is what you're doing. You're praying for enough bread to sustain you at the level in which you plan on operating. Here's what that means. When I pray for bread, I am praying for bread commensurate with my capacity. So what I'm saying is, Lord, I expect to use this. I expect to have a full day of output and expense. So what I'm praying for is enough to keep me at the level I need to be to succeed in a healthy way at the level in which I expend. Got to get this. So think about it like this. The level or the amount of bread that you request or ask for, the expectation of your heart is a telltale sign of the level in which you plan on operating. All right, say it this way. When you go and get a loan for a house, the amount of money you go and get is commensurate with the cost or the expense of the house that you're trying to purchase. Right. So I don't even have to look, in most cases, at what you're trying to get. But in L.A., if you tell me how much money you asked for, I can pretty much tell you what you're going to purchase. Let me say it a different way. Uh, if you go to the store... Make it real, real big. It's bottom shelf stuff right here. Go to the store. You know how you can, you know, you go to the produce market and you put the fruit in the bag yourself, you wrap it up, then you weigh it, and the amount that it comes in, there's a price that's based on the poundage of what you purchase. And then if you take that to the register, they're going to charge you based on the amount that you got. Does that make sense to you? All right. So, so if I go to the store, and I say, I need some oranges. And I only go to the store with $5. That means I only plan on getting $5 worth of oranges. So when I get to the store, if an orange is 89 cents, I can get just about five oranges. But if I say I'm going to the store to get oranges, and I'm going to take $5,000, then that means when I get to the store, I expect when I get there to be able to get $5,000 worth of oranges. That makes sense to you? Here's my point. Sometimes the reason or the way or the intensity or the amount that we pray for in the morning is telling God exactly at what level we expect to operate in the day. And so the reason sometimes that we don't ask for more is because we don't expect to have to use it. But when you realize that God has blessed you with gifts and talents and responsibilities, that means, Lord, when I come to pray to you, I'm not coming to pray a $5 prayer because a $5 prayer doesn't get me enough in the day to do what I expect to accomplish today. But I'm going to pray a $5,000 prayer, in fact, a $5 million prayer, because what I expect to accomplish today is going to take every bit of the kingdom and heaven to make it happen. Is there anybody in here that walks out of your house with high expectations? So when you pray, you pray with a different fervency, because you're not praying this patty cake prayer, that this Mickey Mouse stuff to just do a little bit, but I'm going out in the battle. I'm going to take territories and regions and corporate and nations. And so if I'm going to do what I feel like God 
God has assigned me to do, my prayer life has to shift to accommodate what I'm trying to do. So God, I don't need no bottom level blessing, but I need some top shelf stuff. I need some high level. I need high capacity kingdom agenda stuff because what I'm called to do is not going to be enough for me just to kind of get through and squeeze by and a little bit of here and pinch over there and rob you. I got a million dollar anointing and I need God to fund what I'm doing today. Are there any hungry people in the house that you know that God has given you something so spectacular, something so transcendent that you can't just fumble and be clumsy, but you say, Lord, what I'm called to do is so great, it's so big, I need for you to give me this morning what can keep me throughout this day because eyes have not seen and ears have not heard what you going to do through me. So bless me now that I may do all that you called me to do. Stop selling yourself short. Stop negotiating a lesser deal. I'm just going to get by. I'm just going to. God has blessed you with unusual talents and unique gifts and put a call in your life. We serve a venture, venture capitalist God. Oh, gee, let me say it this way. You understand how venture capitalists work? In essence, I'm going to give you the real crude version. In essence, you and I can have an idea and a plan, and we don't have it in full execution yet. But we go to someone and say, hey, listen, here's the idea and the plan. Here's the know-how I have, my abilities, my talents. Here's my team. Here's how it's worked out. All I need for you to do is fund what I'm called to do. I have everything I need except the money. So a venture capitalist comes in and says, here's what I'll do. I'll join your board and I'll fund your project. I'll take some equity and I'll be a part of what you're doing. All you have to do is bring to bear what you have and I'll take care of funding everything else. This is exactly how God works. Can I challenge you? God is looking for someone that's got an idea, that's got some passion, that's got some execution power. He's waiting to give some money to somebody that will do something with the money that he gives. I, I heard a pastor Chris say a couple of weeks ago, he said, we're asking God to do something and God is saying, what have you done? If you think for one moment, God's going to come in and just bless you sitting on your couch, not to expend it. I I'm sorry, but you're going to be sadly disappointed. But if you've got a vision, if you've got something, if you're excited about what God can allow you to do, God is looking for someone that he can fund to do what he's called them to do. Is there anybody here that as you take inventory of your life, you're saying, Lord, you bless me with too much to sit back and let life pass me by, but I'm going to get up and do something. And God is saying, and that's what I'm looking for. I want some people that have got some gumption, that have some passion, that have got something on the inside of them that's spurring them on to something else. We've been sitting around way too long. We've been satisfied way too long. We've been used to be, remember when people, way too long. And God is saying, I got a fresh dose if you're ready to do something. When I pray this prayer, it reminds me that today I'm going to do something. When I ask for God's blessing, I ain't to sit at home. When I ask for God's wisdom, it's not to be quiet. When I ask for God's grace and mercy, it's not to be alone. I need this stuff because I'm going to engage the culture. And if I'm going to succeed and be sustained in that place, i got to have something that is sustaining me from glory. I am sick and tired of tired people. It gives me an attitude. I'm just confessing this ain't the gospel, this is just Jeremy. I, you don't understand. It drives me crazy to engage constantly with people who don't want nothing and going nowhere and don't really care. It is agonizing. 
I'm looking for people who want to go somewhere, who want to do something who see the power of God available, and they're saying, God, give me a fresh dose because I'm going to take this world by storm. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? You've got too much that's been invested. Here's the fun thing about an investor. An investor is watching his money. He's watching it. He's saying, okay, all right, well, all right. so what you do today? <laughs> well, how are you spending your days? How you spending your time? Wait, why? Because I got an investment there. Okay, okay that's, that's carnal. What the Bible say? The man gave a talent, five and ten. Went away. Came back. What you do with my money? Five guy made it happen. T- doubled it. Ten guy made it happen. The one guy, I went and buried it. I knew you was a cold-blooded dude. I didn't want no problems. So the man said, that's smart. I understand. Okay, come on. Give him some more. We'll try again tomorrow. Nope. Take what he got. Give it to somebody else. Here's what's always haunted me. We are so, that story excites us. But have any of us ever thought, what if I'm the dude they got my stuff taken. I don't even know it. Can I say something to you? Some of us may be sitting here right now. Got our stuff taken. We don't even know it. Because we were filled with fear and criticism. Watch what he said. I knew how you were. Criticize the man that just gave you a talent. You don't criticize me? I just paid you. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Criticism, fear, insecurity cause you to do nothing. And what you have got taken. I'm challenging every hearer in this house and on live stream. Please don't believe that you can spend your life just getting by and think that you are glorifying God. Listen very carefully to me. Don't think because you buried your gift to keep it safe that you are bringing honor and glory to God. If you don't wake up with a passion to engage the world for the kingdom of God, You are not bringing glory and honor to your father. Here's what I've even considered. I've even considered that to know what to do and not do it might be worse of doing what you're not supposed to do. I don't know if I'm sure about that yet, but I'm cogitating that thought. That to know what to do and to sit and do nothing might be worse than doing the wrong thing. And some of us are so afraid of doing the wrong thing that we just sit and do nothing. This is the season. Do you understand that we are in war right now? And we have the competitive advantage if we'll get off our behinds and do something? When you pray this prayer, you say, Lord, all I want is what's for me. When you pray this prayer, you're praying it, and this prayer is kind of checking you to say, wait a minute, am I even hungry? And if I'm not, why not? But this prayer is a prayer that says to you, Lord, God, I need so much of you because I know I'm going to use every ounce of it. God doesn't give wisdom to people who don't make decisions. He doesn't, because it's unnecessary. (laughs) 
God doesn't give strength to people who are going to sit around all day. Strengthen me, Lord, for what? You hear what I'm saying to you? For what? I almost feel like that's the answer sometimes to some of the prayers that we pray. Pray a whole lot of God is like, for what? I'm going to do that for. I'm an investor. I'm an investor. I give expecting a dividend. That's how, that's how he works. Stand to your feet. Here's my point. My point is this. I feel like one of the things Jesus was doing as, as he was all the miracles and, and stuff, I think he was making this point. If, if you look at the progression of miracles in Scripture, look at what he does. God, in his exchange with the world around him, challenges all of the rules, right? Right? He challenged the, the, the rules of, of, of the body. Ears that can't hear, he, ch- he challenges that. He, he shows his authority over it and he, he opens up, up ears. Someone can't speak. There's literally, there's no capacity. He, he shows his authority. He challenges that. The, 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 the idea, the laws of, of material and, and the fact that, that he turns water into wine, he challenges the, the rules that say one substance can't turn into a different substance. He challenges the rules of matter. He takes one lunch and, and he breaks the rules that everyone agrees on to make food for upwards of 15,000 people. So, okay, okay, that's not enough. He goes out into the sea. And the winds and the rain, if all of that just were a magician's trick, gets on a boat, he looks at waves and winds and storms, and he tells it to shut up. Takes authority over, oh, okay, that's, that's not enough. Okay. He says, find me a funeral. And he seeks a dead body. And he brings what is dead back to life. Oh, okay, too soon, because see, in that time, they would, they would actually bury sometimes their deceased the same day sometimes. So that, that's too quick, because maybe the body is still hovering around, or, or the spirits are hovering around. Maybe thought that I was just able to kind of, all right, where, where's Lazarus? How long has he been dead? A day. Let's wait. How about now? It's only been two days. Just a bit more. How about now? Well, it's, it's been three. But you know, Jesus, that the body... You know, that spirit is gone. It, you know, that, that superstition of, of the hover is gone. He says, perfect. And he goes to, to Lazarus and he says, come out. What, what was he doing? Here's my, here's, here's my thing. What he was doing was more for his audience. He was trying to show them that the rules don't matter. He was saying that anything in this world that would seek to establish itself as immovable must bend to my will. Listen, listen. You hearing this? And then he's saying, and greater works could we do. So why are we sitting on our couches? Why are we flipping channels, shaking our heads, saying, oh, this world is going to hell? Why? Why are we pretending to believe in God? Why? And then when it's time to do something great, we're too busy. Just don't come to church anymore. Because you're wasting your time. Either this is what it says it is, or it's not. Either you're in, or you're not. Let's do something. Let's do something. Let's stop praying to God for power and never using it. Praying to God for strength and never expending it. Some of you are praying to God for money that you're just going to blow anyway. What if your dollars were kingdom directed? 
What if you could take resource from heaven and use it to, to, to shake the world for Jesus? What if, what if we did something? We talk a lot about it. But this prayer says, okay, well, how much do you want? Because how much you want will tell me what you expect to do today. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you, family? Every hand lifted. This is one of those sermons that from myself to the most stubborn heart in this house, right? That is a challenge if you heard what the Spirit was saying. We have so many excuses and reasons and, oh, I did that, or, oh, I'm so tired, or, oh, we got all this stuff, I'm so busy, I got this, we got all kind of stuff. And Lord is saying, fine, but don't ask me to give you what you're not going to use. That's fine. If you're not going to do it, that's, that's fine. That's between you and you. You're not going to do it, but d- then don't pray for me to do stuff or to give you blessing. or to, don't, don't ask for that because you don't need it. But I'm praying that in this house right now, there are people that even if it's for the first time, you are finally hungry. You finally want to do something with your life. You finally want to have some place where you're saying, Lord, I may not have what so-and-so has, or do what so, but I don't want that. I just want what you have for me. I want to be the best me at my highest and best use. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Father, I thank you for the people that are gathered not only in this space, but are watching us by live stream. And I thank you for this single notion that you are poised to pour out into us. You're poised to. You want to give us more gifts. You want to give us more grace. You want to you expand the fruit in our life. You want to do all that stuff, God, but you are waiting for us to want to do something with it. So we refuse, Lord, to be apathetic. We refuse to be lethargic. We refuse to be used to be and remember when people, but today make a fresh commitment that as we ask for bread and we pray for an outpouring, that we are ready and poised, Lord God, to go out and do something great for you. So God, seal this word in their hearts. Every single one, there will be a newfound passion, a newfound vigor, a newfound excitement, Lord, to do what you have called them to do, that you would establish in them a fresh hunger each day, Lord God, to take this world by storm, Lord God, to walk in an unusual power, Father. Let them, Lord God, understand that you, Lord, have greater works in store. If they would just get up, and do something. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest from the Bible with us now henceforth and forevermore. And the people of God said amen. God bless y'all. Have a great day. I'll provide the sacrifice.